All right, Candy, interested in starting one? A lot of chat from customers or from vendors? Both, okay, that's good to hear. I feel like you do need both teams on, on board in order to launch into this project. Couple more minutes and then we'll get started. All right, I will keep my eye on the participants and let people in, but I think we should just go ahead and get started. So Ashley wanted to be here. She is currently having some computer problems. So I'm gonna take over for our intro for today. So welcome. Um, Ofma is hosting this workshop, but we have a wonderful panel of presenters who are going to be sharing um, all of the information with you today. So welcome, this is being recorded. Um, as always, totally fine to be off camera. We welcome you to be on camera and participate. Um, if you have anything you'd like to say, you can always raise your hand or in chat, and I will be um, monitoring the chat throughout, and we can save questions for later. But I am just going to go ahead and hand it off to our wonderful panel of presenters who are going to be handling the rest of this workshop from here. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Madeline. Um, I'm happy to be here. My name is Hannah Ladwig. I'm with Gorge Grown Food Network. Um, I worked with Jess Land with Oregon City Farmers Market and Lisa Hall with Montevilla Farmers Market to um, put this workshop together. So big thanks to the two of them and to Ofma. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, that'd be great. Um, so I really wanted to kind of, uh, well, first thank Ofma. This presentation is part of a FMPP grant that Gorge Grown Food Network has, and we had written it in to be a workshop with just Gorge Market Managers. And I, I was like, oh, let's like widen it out um, to provide a state statewide resource for folks and kind of beyond just our, um, you know, handful of markets here in the Gorge. So thanks to Ashley and the Ofma team for um, helping us coordinate that. So we're just going to kind of do a little bit of an overview of our winter markets and our experience. So like wins and woes, share some data and some lessons learned. And then we have plenty of time for questions. Um, there's also a lot of um, experience, you know, amongst the attendees. So happy to have more of a conversation than, um, you know, a panel of, of experts. Um, so it can be really more conversational. Um, all right. So next slide. Um, so Hood River Farmers Market, that's the market I manage, um, and I'll be sharing about we are the only year-round farmers market in the Columbia Gorge. Uh, next slide. So kind of just a, a little bit of an overview about our market seasons. We kind of have two distinct seasons. Um, so we have what we call our regular season or the core season, which is um, May through November. It's every Saturday, 9 to 1. We're outside in a city-owned parking lot, and we opened in 2006. Our winter season started in January of 2017, so, you know, more than 10 years after the uh, initial first season of the market. We run December through April, and we've kind of settled on this every other week um, schedule for now, so first, third, and fifth Saturdays. We shorten our hours 10 to 12. And our current location is uh, still outdoors, but it's partially sheltered. And I'll kind of talk about that. Um, but we do kind of have these two distinct seasons. Uh, so next slide. Um, so like I, I said, we our location changes. That first one, first photo on the left there is our, you know, parking lot location during the core season. And then we move down to ferment brewing on the waterfront uh, here in Hood River. And they have kind of this like, sheltered vestibule area, which is really nice in case, you know, the rain or, or anything like that. There's partial cover for vendors. It's still outside. 
um, which was really helpful during COVID, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and then it allows us a little bit of room to grow where vendors can also pop up tents on nice days on the lawn. Um, so next slide. Um, and Hood River is a small town. The regular season is about a half mile from the winter season location. So even if you forget where you're going that day, it's not a huge deal. It's a, you know, a two minute drive. So just kind of setting the scene for where our, our markets are located. Uh, next slide. Um, so kind of going to just share like a, a broad history of the winter season. Um, so I started managing the Hoover Farmers Market in 2016. So my first winter season, we started this, um, the winter market. It was open just once a month on the second Saturdays from 1 to 4 p.m. And that time didn't really align with our regular schedule, but um, it worked best for our market hosts, was, which at the time was a local winery, which was a few blocks from our regular location. It was indoors, which was nice. Um, and we decided to start the market to provide local residents a year-round option um, for a long time and, and still a little bit, but um, businesses closed down in Hood River during the winter time, which is really frustrating for locals um, to see businesses just open during the booming tourism season. So we really wanted to provide a local outlet for, for residents year round. We wanted to encourage producers to explore uh, season extension and year round production. And we also had a VeggieRx program. We still have a VeggieRx program at the time, but um, at, at that time, it was you could only spend um, your vouchers at the farmer's market. Um, so we would have all this money come into the market during the you know regular season. And then we didn't have an option for um, VeggieRx recipients during the winter. Um, so then we had to start working with uh, grocery stores because we didn't have a year-round option for the farmer's market. And so we had all of this healthcare funding that we had secured that was supposed to go to local food that was going to the grocery store for people to buy, you know, produce that was grown around the world, essentially. So we wanted to start providing this year round option for everyone. Um, and when we started this market, I would say the key words were meats and treats. There's a lot of meat vendors and treat vendors, right? Bread, sweets, things like that. Um, some like grocery staples, but not a ton of produce, you know, microgreens, maybe some storage crops. Um, so that was like our real starting point for us is just kind of meats and treats. And then, you know, we were able to go from there, which I'll talk about next slide. Um, so our second winter season, we decided to go from once a month to twice a month. Um, we stayed in the same location. Um, then that following year, we were really feeling the growing pains of being, you know, inside at the local winery, um, just a few blocks away from the regular season location. And we really wanted to better align the time, you know, we were open, you know, nine to one in the summer and then to move from one to four in the winter is, was a little bit too jarring for folks. Um, so then they uh, remodeled or rebuilt a local elementary school here, and it was it's beautiful. It's a beautiful school. It had a great cafeteria, really open. Um, so we moved in there, <laughs> um, winter of 2020, which worked for a few markets. And then obviously um, we couldn't continue the season due to COVID. Um, so it worked great for a short time there. Um, then to kind of be flexible with the pandemic and kind of find a, a more permanent space. We decided to move to our current spot, um, which is downtown on the water or down on the waterfront at Ferment, which uh, which you saw those photos. So it is like it was really nice to have it there during the pandemic. People felt pretty safe shopping outside. It's partially sheltered. There's easy parking. We better aligned the hours to match our. Um, our uh, regular season time. Um, it is a two hour market though, so shortened it. So it starts an hour later and ends an hour sooner. So 10 to 12, which is really nice when you're talking about being outside in you know, January and February. Um, so that's kind of like the history of, of our winter season. Um, next slide. 
Um, I'm going to share some data. So our average attendance count during our core season is about 1200 a week, which is a, you know, it's a four hour market and we average about 47 vendors. You can kind of see that sales breakdown where, you know, a good chunk of it is produce, um, value added products, grocery products and meat. Um, then the winter season, you know, obviously customer attendance does drop down. Um, consider that it is a two hour market though. So like it is still pretty, pretty busy to have about 500 people come through in two hours. Um, we have about 25 vendors each week. Um, and you can kind of see um, even a little bit more, <laughs> a little bit of that remaining meats and treats like I talked about, right? So the red and the yellow on that second pie chart, that's um, you know meat and value added and grocery products. Um, produce is still a significant chunk though. So that's, we've really grown it. Um, but that's kind of the sales breakdown of uh, the winter season. Uh, next slide. Um, so our market hits, you know, gross combined sales of just over just over a million each year, um, which is great for our small town. Um, you can kind of see here the sales breakdown. So on the left, that graph, the blue, the small ones are like the winter season. Um, and then the red is the regular season. So that's like why it's broken down that way. And then on the right side is just the winter season annual sales. So you can see we've grown the market, which is really nice, um, both the winter season and the regular season. And that winter season, it's not, you know, it's not a huge piece of our gross sales, but it is a nice bump. And considering um, you know, there's 25 vendors there a week. They're making money. They're making, you know, money throughout the year, which is nice. Um, it's not insignificant, I would say, but it is a small piece. Uh, next slide. Um, and then we like to think about, you know, success beyond data. Uh, we've had a few farmers change their production uh, to anchor the winter season. They're growing mostly storage crops, hardy greens, things like that, instead of trying to compete with, you know, the 13 other farmers we have during the core season, which is really nice. They can anchor the, the winter season and, and be really successful. Um, we think that the year-round selling option is a nice additional selling point to vendors who are thinking about joining a market. It kind of gives us an edge for, over other markets. Um, we also think it's a pretty strong sponsorship pitch. You know, if somebody can, um, uh, we can, they can advertise with us for a year versus our seven month season. Um, it's a little bit of a stronger pitch. I really like that we don't need to retrain customers to get back into the swing of shopping at the farmer's market. Um, and being the only year round market in the gorge draws customers from beyond Hood River to come to the market in the winter time. And then they realize, oh, this is a great market. I'll come back, you know, they come back, you know, any time of the year. Um, and then we're also able to employ market staff year round. Um, we have part-time market staff and it's, it's so nice to be able to keep them on. Um, you know, their hours obviously do drop a little bit because we're not every week, we go every other, but it helps in retaining staff, not needing to train somebody new every year. Uh, so that's been really nice as well. Um, I think that's my last slide. And Lisa, I think, is up next. We go to the next slide. Yep, right. All right, I'll hand it off to Lisa. Wonderful, thank you. So um, like Hannah said, my name is Lisa Hall. I'm the executive director at Montevillo Farmers Market, but I was hired as the market manager um, in 2020. You can go to the next slide. So a little history about this market. Um, it's located in Southeast Portland along a historic business district. And it was opened in 2007 um, by just a group of community members and volunteers and our local business association. The market is still in the location um, today as it was in 2007 as well. So we started with a pretty average, uh, just growing season market. And then in 2010, so three years later, the market added on their winter stock up markets. So these were once a month, just December, January, and February. 
in addition to a harvest market the Sunday before Thanksgiving. So at first these markets started at just two hours, kind of like Gorge Grown, um, 11th one, but then eight years later, they expanded to be four hour market, 10 to two, which is the same as um, the weekly season. And this was because uh, farmers were asking for it. So in 2020, the market expanded to being full year round. So now we are twice a month, um, November through April. And then this year, so three years later, um, we are now going to be weekly May through December and still keeping that twice a month, um, January through April. And I couldn't find too much vendor information about the original winter stock up markets like numbers, but I did find in the 2014 budget that they were expecting between 17 and 22 vendors um, at each winter stock up market. So just as a little uh, overview, the market really took a while to get to, to our winter season that we have right now. Started with just growing, added those once a month, became year round and is now expanding that year round season. And this is a fun poster I found from uh, 2012. Next slide. So when you are trying to figure out whether you wanna expand your market to include a winter season, um, I think farmer support is honestly the, the number one thing that uh, you need, at least uh, that's what we had when um, we were expanding. Growing winter crops is, um, it takes a lot of resources uh, because so many of the crops are grown at the same time as like the, the heat leaven crops, like your tomatoes and peppers that make you a lot of money. You need a lot more land and space just to, to grow them and staff to um, harvest. And you also need a lot of um, cold storage space and dry storage space because most everything is grown in the growing season and then it's just stored and can be sold in winter. You also need to make sure your farmers will have enough stuff stored to last your entire winter season. Um, it really sucks when all of your farmers stop in April because they sold everything and everything's this big and then all of your customers are asking you where the vegetables are. Um, so Monoville Farmers Market specifically had a lot of uh, vendors asking us to do a winter market and uh, pictured here is Fiddlehead Farm and they actually changed to be only winter season once, once we made that um, switch. So of course you also need shopper support. Um, you don't have anybody coming to your market, why, why are you having it? Uh, our neighborhood, um, or our market specifically is definitely a, a grocery access point. A lot of people come and, and buy their weekly groceries. They're not necessarily, it's not a tourist attraction for them. Um, we have a lot of people who are walking to the market with their families um, and who will come every week to, to buy their groceries. Um, we also kind of had just the perfect storm that allowed us to become a uh, year round. So I started at the market um, on October 11th and we decided to become year round on October 20th. Um, so it was, they got a new staff member. I, I wanted more hours, I wanted to be year round. Um, and so adding the dates allowed us to have the revenue to do that. And we had the, the vendors and it was also winter 2020. So our shoppers wanted a outdoor shopping experience um, that they felt more safe. Um, it was also a time when everyone was, we have to support local and uh, help small businesses. Um, and people were bored. They needed something to do in the winter time. Uh, so for us, that just kind of um, magically helped. And we made that decision so late in the season because our farmers had already had other winter outlets. So they had already planned to be growing a lot of winter produce, um, which I think was kind of a unique situation. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So here is a little bit of data. Um, so the 2022, 2023 winter season we just had, and then the 2022 was just last year. Um, so winter is 10 dates, weekly is 30. Um, you'll notice our vendor counts are actually pretty similar between the two. And that uh, is because of a couple of reasons. Mostly we allow craft vendors to come to our winter market where we don't for our, win uh, for our weekly. 
And this kind of helps us just fill out the market a little bit more and hopefully attracts um, some shoppers that are looking for like gift ideas and such. Um, we also do have a couple only winter vendors, like I was saying, Fiddlehead Farm. Um, we also have another farmer who their weekly season is at a different neighborhood market that's not part of our organization, but they come to us because they want a winter outlet as well. Our crowd counts um, are pretty different between the two uh, seasons on average. Um, and I will say this last winter season was actually a lot lower than the years before. Um, and I, I mean, I'm making this up, but I have a couple of reasons why I think why. Uh, it was honestly terrible weather this year, um, especially on Sundays. It was just very rainy, very cold and windy. We had multiple snow days. Um, it was also uh, a time when people are feeling more comfortable and safe shopping indoors. Um, they don't necessarily need that uh, community aspect. Sorry, my phone's going off. Um, and then it was also a time when inflation was very much in the news and prices are going up and people are having um, to uh, budget a little bit more, um, which I think all kind of contributed to that. Um, and then uh, for our sales, uh, with just the 10 dates, and even though we had lower customer accounts, our vendors still took home over $280,000, which is, um, I think, really significant to small businesses and especially businesses who want to be able to um, survive year round and someone who maybe wants to quit their full-time job and actually uh, do their vendor business um, uh, all year, which is uh, important. So this line graph over to the right, uh, the light blue line shows our customer counts. And I actually started this in January, 2022, which is the winter season before I have this data for, just to kind of show that our customer counts were a bit higher last year um, in that winter season. And then of course it goes up for summer when there's just a lot more um, tourists and there's berries and stone fruit. And then it dipped down pretty significantly this last winter season. Um, I also added the last two months we've had because it went right back up um, between April and May of this year. Uh, we had a thousand person difference. And I'm like, why? Why were you? Um, we don't know. <laughs> um, let's see, the dark blue line is average vendor sales throughout all of the months, uh, which I wanted to add because it's pr a pretty flat line compared to our customer counts. Um, so even though customer counts were low, our vendor sales weren't necessarily that much different on average per vendor um, than in summer. Let's see, and then yeah, the bar graph underneath it kind of shows that average of vendor sales and farmer sales um, between the winter and weekly. And it's, it's not a huge significant jump between the two seasons. And the last thing I wanted to touch on is uh, having a winter season um, can also be helpful for food access for your community. So in winter, we distributed over $15,000 in SNAP benefits um, and over $11,000 in double food bucks. And the averages between for each market um, isn't super different from our weekly season as well. So that kind of just shows us that it is um, uh, an important food access, especially for um, being able to distribute double food bucks. Next. Great. And lastly, I just wanted to touch on um, marketing a winter season because it's kind of hard. Um, a lot of people don't think of farmers markets being open in winter. Uh, so it's, uh, there's a lot of planning on it and a lot of education. Um, we have a decent amount of out market signage, especially the first season. I, I put a new sign out every single week saying next market is this date um, because we're not every single week. Uh, in the top corner um, is a picture that was actually an ad that we put in a newspaper, but it's really similar to a banner that we had on our fence. Uh, because we aren't every week, it's really important to have the specific dates for people to know. Um, I've heard a couple of sad stories of people showing up to the market and we aren't there. So those uh, specific dates are, are really important. We also do winter specific posters that we put in our um, all the local businesses. 
And then I do a lot of date reminders on social media and newsletter. I, I continue to do our weekly newsletter all through winter, even when we don't have a, a market, just to reiterate when we're open um, and talk about winter vegetables and uh, just kind of keep it on people's minds. Education around winter vegetables can be difficult. Uh, a lot of people didn't necessarily grow up eating winter vegetables like, like me. I, I absolutely did not know what a celeriac was for most of my life. Um, and they aren't necessarily as beautiful as they're beautiful in their own way, but they're, they're not as eye-catching as tomatoes or berries or cherries. Um, uh, so it's, it's important to try to capture them in ways that look interesting and cool and get people excited and, uh, and educate about how to cook things and how it can be really easy still, or here's a fun complicated recipe if you're into that. Um, yeah, it's, it's important to get people to want to actually buy some of those products that aren't as familiar. And then what I was trying to show in kind of the, the bottom photo with, with all the different products is you, there's still a, an abundance in winter. Um, and that's really important. People assume that you go to a winter market, it's like, oh, there's not really gonna be much there, but uh, you have to keep reminding folks that you, you can still buy most of your groceries at the farmer's market, even in winter. Um, and it can still be beautiful and colorful and, and fun. Um, we also have a uh, special programming just in the winter season. We got a grant to do pop club. So giving kids uh, $3 to spend on fruits and veggies. Um, and we decided just to do it during the, the colder months, mostly because we didn't have that much money for it. So uh, it allowed us to stretch the dollar a little bit more and hopefully uh, encourages more people to come just for the winter season. And if families come maybe once in a while, hopefully they'll, they'll start coming every week so they can participate in that uh, special program. And then the final thing I wanted to touch on is um, extreme weather. Uh, and with your marketing, it's, uh, you may need to close a market uh, once in a while, especially if you're outside, if you're not under um, cover. And it's just so important to have that plan because a lot of times you're making this decision on sat like the day before, the two days before, and maybe that's your day off. Um, and so you have to work it, which is annoying, but, but having a plan is, is really important. And that's updating your social media, putting out a newsletter, updating your website, changing your voicemail. Um, it's emailing all your vendors and saying, hey, you need to respond to me, don't show up. And if they don't respond, you're, you're calling them, being like, hey, please don't bake your bread, don't harvest, um, we're not having market. We also, uh, when we're in the decision process of whether we are gonna close, we do try to talk to as many farmers as possible too, just to kind of see like, can you make it in? I, I know it's really snowy over there. Um, or have you already harvested? Or, or if we change the date to next week, could you make it um, type thing just because they are, uh, that's a lot of the reasons why we're having the market. So it's important to have them um, give input. Not that they necessarily make all the decisions because you sometimes you have to close because of actual safety. And we have had farmers still come even though it's been an ice storm and they'll still come and sell kale <laughs> at the market. And you're like, okay, what do you do? You? Um, and then of course, if you're still open, you need to show excitement. Like this is Allie frolicking in the snow because uh, we were like, no, we're still open. Please come and buy vegetables. And that is my, my spiel. Uh, so now it's Jess. Well, I'm not going to share uh, anything new that <laughs> Hannah and Lisa haven't already uh, touched on. So um, I, anyway, thank you for such great presentations. But I'm Jess Land, and I'm both the director and the market manager uh, here in Oregon City Farmers Market. Um, and so, Madeline, you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, we started a um, farmer's market year round back in 2011. Um, and they were for various reasons. And like Hannah and Lisa mentioned, it was uh, farmers that were looking for a year round venue to sell. It did allow for increased revenue, both for vendors and um, the market. It has provided year-round employment for staff um, 
I've been able to hire um, two assistants, which has been really helpful because uh, before that it was myself and a part-time assistant. And now this has given um, staff some year-round hours, which has been great because I don't want to lose them. <laughs> and of course, the income opportunities um, to vendors. It's an opportunity for our farms to sell the winter produce and storage crops. And like uh, Lisa was saying about uh, Fiddlehead, we also have um, some winter uh, farmers that have transitioned to only winter crops. And that is what their business is now, which is great for us because we can count on them to be here uh, for the winter season with a um, uh, plenty of inventory, of course, pending weather. Uh, we love being a year-round point of uh, local food access. We serve a fairly uh, large SNAP demographic. So out here in Oregon City, it's really helpful for, uh, for that we're here. Um, we uh, schedule our market every other week. This also allows some vendors that we normally wouldn't have um, come to join us for winter. Uh, due to their summer markets closing and they're looking to sell, you know, year round. Uh, so we've really benefited from a really robust and diverse group of vendors. The only problem is everyone gets used to them. And then when summer starts, they move on to their, their, you know, home market, so to speak. So it's a whole like retraining of customers that they're, they'll be back <laughs> next season. And of course, um, Unique varieties and products to showcase, uh, you know, unique, um, like the celeriacs, <laughs> different uh, greens and opportunities to educate customers about uh, trying new um, vegetables. It's also really nice. Our, a lot of our vendors will provide recipes of how to use um, different crops uh, or cuts of meat or whatnot, which is uh, also another really great incentive for folks to, to try something new. And then I just included here, this was our winter poster uh, that we put up. So I go ahead and I, like the others, put in the dates. Um, it, we are every other Saturday. Our hours do change. Uh, we're normally 9 to 2, but in the winter we're 10 to 2. And then I just sort of highlight the different things that we feature during winter market. Um we still do power of produce. We don't do activities, but we still do the tokens. So uh, that can still increase some sales for, for vendors or for farms as well. Um, I think I'm ready for the next slide. So um, one thing about winter market, I will say uh, about the promotion is it one does have to be fastidious in how you go about promoting the market. Um, so our reasons for hosting it, uh, we decided because folks can utilize SNAP and Double Up Food Bucks through the entire year. And kind of what I've shared before, um, farms become strategic in terms of their winter offerings. We also have a lot of our vendors that can bring value added and farm direct goods. For instance, we have one farm um, that will do some like pickling of their crops. So that's kind of a nice add-on item to bring to market and a new way to repurpose summer crops into uh, Farm Direct. And it helps for increased revenue when the crops are less abundant. Um, the, then we also host some special events. We do like a harvest and a holiday market, kind of, and we kind of call them like stock up markets or celebratory markets. They're really fun. Our board will come and serve hot apple cider that we get from Kiyakawa. Um, Sometimes we'll have special music or carolers, but it's always super festive. That brings a really good group of customers out with really good sales. And of course, you're seeing now a sunny day. Um, Surprisingly, we had a few of those last winter on a Saturday of all things, but um, we take photos of, of uh, the sunny days when we can. <laughs> oh, I think I'm ready, Madeline. Like I said, we started in 2011 as year round, but the market initially started in 2005 with a total of five vendors. And so now... Um, 
weeks. We do, as I said, since we operate year round, we do take an additional week off at the end of the year. Usually by then everyone's exhausted and they don't really bulk at an extra week off. It's great for staff um, and vendors are usually kind of ready for a little break. Uh, so our winter season, we begin in November. It goes through the end of April. We average about 55 to 60 vendors each market uh, with customer counts averaging about 1,200 per market. Uh, we did snap sales for uh, winter 22, 23. We were at um, $10,865. That's just snap. That didn't include double up. We noticed, uh, it was surprising actually, we did a DOT survey and we're surprised to find out that 66% of our customers traveled to our market outside of Oregon City from multiple counties. Um, of course, the largest being Clackamas, but we are the only year round market in Clackamas County. So we get folks um, you know, from Tualatin or Milwaukee, outlying areas, Estacada and such, which is great for us because they'll make a point to travel in. It's, a, it's an event because it's winter and not as much to do outside. Uh, we found the customers on average spend about $45 per market visit. And our booth revenue for the winter season, we took in $32,665, which was uh, really helpful for our operations. Uh, all righty, I think I'm ready, Madeline. Uh, we do stay in our same location year round. Uh, we are in a big thing right now of possibly moving our market from Clackamas County um, campus over to Clackamas Community College. Uh, so that's been a big change that we are literally in the midst of working out. But currently our map does shrink slightly and some of the vendors like change locations for their booth in the winter season, but we do allow a couple of what we call perks. Um, we allow close <clears throat> vendor parking to kind of help offset you know, negative weather. We also um, found that our vendor numbers are usually about the same as summer. So we don't really have that big of a difference with our, um, with our vendor amounts. One thing I wanted, oh, I'll get to that when we get to the weather. I think I'm, oh, well, go ahead. <laughs> uh, so some woes <laughs> about winter markets, if we're being honest, is the fact that we, we do operate every other week can, even with posting dates, can still be really confusing for customers. And every week we have folks show up wondering why the market isn't um, going on. And then they take it to like, oh, like community social media pages. Why isn't the market open? And it, despite like fastidious promotion and newsletters and social media about dates, it just some falls through the cracks for some folks. Um, and also we found that customers still don't realize we're open year round, including county employees where we operate. <laughs> so when we've gone out to do outreach uh, fairs and whatnot, that's been a big um, challenge that we are trying to change the narrative on and um, kind of increase even more outreach to, to let folks know we're here. Uh, weather and winter challenges do uh, pose issues. We are kind of on a bluff area, so our wind can be very sudden and very extreme. We do tend to get kind of icy and whatnot. So what uh, we decided was we we have, um, I wish I, I'm sorry I didn't put one up. Uh, we have winter bookmarks and summer bookmarks, and each of them have all the dates um, and what's going on through the season and whatnot. But we did add this uh, since last year, um, after the fires, I think it was, is when we started implementing it. We put a QR code on the front of the bookmark and customers can, for those that, that are able to, can open their phone camera, scan the code, and it will direct them to our website where we can put a pop-up market closed due to ice or whatnot. And that's been kind of helpful for, for people because they like to put their bookmarks up on their fridge and it's convenient for them to, to check. Uh, so we also do a lot of um, heavy promotion when we do have to close. It is very rare. Thankfully, we didn't have to last year, uh, but the year before we had to twice. Um, again, it, it's a definite event for our community. 
folks are super um, supportive and excited to come out. Um, and it's always a really, even in the snow and rain, we have a very committed um, customer group. Do I have any more slides? <laughs> I think that was it. Kind of sums it up. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you guys. Um, yeah, so now we can kind of open it up. We're happy to answer any questions. And like I said, there's also experience just among att attendees. So it can be more conversational. Um, we kind of talked about adverse weather. Um, curious if maybe folks have experienced unexpected drawbacks or even unexpected successes that, that we might not have, have touched on. Um, but again, happy to answer like just any questions that folks have. And I think we can stop the presentation, maybe just open it up to a to a chat so we can see folks. Cool. Yeah, does anybody have any questions? Hi, um, I'm Julia. I'm at the Vancouver Farmers Market, and we have had the fall market in November and December, Saturdays only, for the past few years, I think since like 2019 or 2020. And this year, we are expanding for the first time into being year-round. So we're adding on January, February, and March being Saturday only as well before going into our regular season. So this is our first year. Um, so we still have a lot of questions. And so I have a couple of questions that I was hoping people could provide guidance on. Um, the first is how do you help ag uh, your agriculture vendors with the transition? Um, did they need greenhouses to do year round? Did they need additional infrastructure? Um, did they need to hire staff on year round? Like what kinds of changes did your ag vendors need to make? And then also, how did you think about the market mix in terms of vendors on the street? Um, we have a huge artisan population at my market. So I anticipate we'll have a lot of artisans that are interested in the winter market. And I'm worried, I don't want it to be just an artisan market. I wanna make sure we have a strong farmer representation as well so that it still feels like a farmer's market. Um, so kind of curious about how you uh, worked with that mix of all of your different vendors. Um, I'm gonna try to answer all your questions. For how did we support our ag vendors? So we, I had mentioned how we had VegRx funding and that's kind of why we wanted to extend um, into the winter. We actually forward contracted with um, vendors to grow uh, winter storage crops. And so um, we were able to, you know, provide them funding to do that up front. Um, yes, Rebecca also says um, Nash, the national, what does NRCS stand for? Conservation something. National right. Conservation, hmm, okay. Yeah. Um, they're, they're in your, if you have a USDA service center, that's probably where they are physically. Yeah. So, um, some of our growers have gotten high tunnels, um, through that. We've also worked with like OSU extension and WSU extension to provide education. Um, so those are things that we've done. Um, and then about like your ven vendor mix, we have a, um, two to one ratio um, guideline in our vendor, um, in our market handbook. So there can't be more than, um, well, basically we have to have two, two vendors selling food for every craft <laughs> vendor. Um, and so sometimes that limits the amount of craft vendors you can have, which is nice. And then if you have more artisans that want to attend, it's nice to put them on a rotating schedule because then the market always feels new and different and a reason for people to come to every market because they're always going to find something different, um, which we found works works kind of well. We do that just for our market in general, not just our winter market season. So I hope that answers some. And does anybody have any other suggestions? Yeah, we really, or I try to really limit the amount of crafts because like you said, Hannah, uh, we're a farm market and we're not a craft market. So even if it means we shrink the market down, we'll always be food first. Um, out in our area, the majority of our vendors are farms and prepared foods. We even have some um, year-round 
uh, flower vendors because they're doing it all in, in greenhouses. Uh, so that's just kind of been our, our experience. Um, it happens in winter. Thankfully, we don't get a huge amount of uh, craft applications versus summer, which helps, but we, I, I do end up declining quite a bit just simply for that reason. Um, it's just too many. Awesome. Thank you. That's really helpful. I like the idea of a ratio and kind of setting a standard to work within. We honestly don't get a ton of craft vendor applications. And I think because we're just in winter, so it's like people just don't know about it as much. So I think we had like four last winter. Mm -hmm. um, but I was going to mention for our craft vendors and honestly, any food vendor that doesn't meet our sourcing requirements, we charge a percentage of their gross sales um, with a minimum of the normal food artisan rate. And so that's just a way to be like, well, if we're going to have craft vendors, that extra money is still like supporting our farmers because we don't have to uh, charge them as much. Or we have a couple like reduced um, fees for like beginning farmers and such. So it's like that can help subsidize it. Okay. Hey, Brian. Say that again. Um, um, you you do a percentage of sales just on the crafters. Uh, anyone who doesn't meet our sourcing requirements, so we require twenty percent farm direct. Um, so like that's a lot of like our alcohol vendors. Um, they are they're not necessarily using farm direct grains, uh, and so they pay either ten percent of the gross sales or fifty five dollars, whatever is higher. And then all the craft vendors fall into that category also. Um, I had a few questions. Well, thank you all for presenting. It's great to see you all too. Um, I had a few questions um, just about kind of the getting the vendor applications and improving and vendor orientation side of things. Um, and San Diego, I was able to go to the conference there this year um, and they're like, yeah, you know, year round doesn't really make a difference in California, but here um, January through April is very different from the main season. Um, so how do you all structure your vendor applications um, to be year round and how do you offer those orientations? We uh, use Manage My Market as our platform for applications. So I will do uh, twice a year, I'll open the application portal for summer season and then again for winter season, um, which seems to work pretty well to keep the, the seasons different. As far as vendor orientation, most of my vendors are returning. And then for ones that aren't, I'll do an individual orientation with them, usually via email with attachments and whatnot, and then they can reach out with questions. Um, that seems to work pretty well for like, if I'm going to open up winter market, I'll usually open it um, like the first week of September um, since we start in early November, but it does take extra work to keep reminding vendors, get your application in <laughs> before I close it. So we, um, so when we open our applications in January, we open it for May through April. So it's, so when you apply for the main season, you can also apply for the winter. Um, and that's how we get most of our applications because most of our vendors that are in our winter season are in our uh, weekly season. Um, I think la I think last couple of years, we have been opening it again in September. Um, and then if people do apply, uh, we, we recorded our orientation. Um, and so we'll just like send them the recording and then uh, some more information. But honestly, what I found is when vendors start in just winter for us specifically, um, they don't do as well because they didn't get the loyalty from all of our shoppers for so long. And then in winter, people are like cold and wet and they're just getting in and getting out and they're getting their bait, like they're going to the vendors they already know. So I, I've kind of found that that's how a lot of vendors, they'll, they'll do it because it can kind of get them into the main season. Um, 
So that's also something to watch out for is if you don't want this person in your weekly season, you don't, or person vendor, um, you may not want to accept them for the winter or be really clear. It's like, no, we, we can't accept you for the, the summer season. Um, but yeah, but yeah, we just opened the application for the whole year. Yeah, for us, when somebody applies, um, we have like, they apply to our core season. They can mark if they're interested in any of our other farmers markets because we do, you know, we have the white salmon market we, and then we have the winter market. So they just mark their interest. And then I um, send them, if they're already participating with us, if they're already an approved vendor, um, I send them like a sh really short addendum to apply to the winter season, which is essentially like mark the dates you want to attend your booth uh, size option. And then if your products are going to change at all, I need to like know that essentially. Um, but I try to make it really easy on them to just kind of tack on the dates that they want for the winter season. And then if they're a new vendor, um, you, they have to like go through a regular application process like they would um, for the core season. But again, it's nice to be really clear. Like Lisa said, you might have somebody apply to the winter season and then they might assume, oh, I'm a vendor now. I, I'll be accepted to the core season, which isn't always the case. So it's nice to be pretty clear about that. Oh, thank you all. I have a question. I was wondering for markets when you were thinking about, do you, I'm wondering about staffing and how like going from that, from part of the year to the full year. And a lot of markets don't have very sophisticated like time off policies for their staff or assistance or who. So when you go to like, Sometimes not having a winter market is like the only way for a market manager to have time off. And I'm wondering if there were discussions around like when you made these decisions to become more full season, if there were also a bunch of HR discussions about how staff time and time off and things like that would be handled. I don't know. Um, oh, go yeah. ahead, Hannah. I was going to say for us, so like I'm full time at Gorge Grown, so part of that comes with, you know, PTO and everything. So that is like kind of handled on my end. For my market staff, though, like we just ask them, like, you know, sometimes they're only working like 10 hours a month, so they don't really have PTO. But, you know, like we want people to feel like supported and like they can take time off. And if they want to go on vacation and they have like a, you know, family event. So we just really ask that people are like, you know, like they plan ahead, like they just let us know when they need off. And hopefully because we have, you know, a team of um, seasonal market managers who like do our other markets, then we can have enough time to fill in. Um, so uh, Amanda, essentially no, but it hasn't really been a problem, I don't think. <laughs> that actually um, dovetails with another issue. I'm just a, con my my regular season market is a contractor for a winter market. But what I find is that, and I, yeah, I work year round and I don't expect um, time off at all really, but it's also my best planning horizon. January through March is the most intense part of my work year because I'm planning everything that's go gonna go on in the regular season. So anybody has any, any tips about how you work on the future while you're while you're in the daily grind that would be appreciated i think i'd like to know that too <laughs> time off um is strange in this industry uh we do a shared google drive or Google Doc that my assistants, if they need a Saturday off, they can just plug it in. And then we arrange with like bringing in some volunteers or whatnot. Um, I don't know what time off looks like from my, my end, but I'll tell you one thing, the burnout is real. <laughs> yeah, And we well, do not have the, benefits. Does the every other help uh, those of you that are doing your, your uh, winter market every other, does that help a little bit though? 
I, I think so. In my, my perspective, it does, you know, like it is, yeah, I think it helps. I, I will yes, say I really on the, on the flip side of that Corvallis indoor winter used to be twice, twice a month. And when it did go every week, that um, made our crowd numbers soar. Uh, I wasn't running it really at that time, but uh, some of the the small farms uh, program folks uh, from OSU were encouraging them at that time to go uh, to go full on, and we have a 14 week season now, and it is a lot stronger. But I think this depends in part where you are. The way things work in the Portland area is different than how they would work in Corvallis. Am, am I correct that? You don't all go on the same Saturday or Sunday. That that there's some there's some market every weekend in Portland area. I think Portland uh, PFM, I believe, is weekly. If I'm not mistaken, yes. right? Yeah. But and do so, those yeah. of you that are those of you that are every two a week, two a month, excuse me, are you all on the same weekend? Lisa, I think you and I alternate, don't we? The last two years, Mona Villa was the only one that alternated with mm -hmm. Hillsdale, Hollywood, and Oregon City. But this next year, we're all going to be on the same, unfortunately. Well, there are some advantages to farmers from that. If you have some of you have farmers in common and they, you know, do one hellacious prep period and fan out and do yeah. your markets. But um, but from the customer standpoint, that seems like that would be non-optimal. Um, I wanted to answer some of the questions. Uh, Amanda, at the beginning, changing over, it was it was rough because it was it was just me and then and Jeff are our, our like at market person. Um, so yeah, I didn't take time off, but because it was every other week, like I had my weekend like weekends once in a while. Um, but then very quickly realized that our market was too big to run with just two people, so we did hire um, an assistant market manager. And they were trained to like take over if I was gone. So then we would like pay one of my friends a hundred dollars in market tokens and be like, hey, will you come and, and like be the other person here for the customer accounts and helping tearing them down and stuff. But Rebecca, now I am not operations. I'm doing like uh, I'm the executive director, but now we have an operations manager. And so even in winter. Allie's kind of in the trenches, but I can help plan things. Um, so it's, we're both part-time. So that kind of is a bummer because we don't have enough money to pay any of us full-time. Full um, but it is kind of nice having that separation of responsibilities um, for, for that specific reason. I guess that's kind of how I'm, I'm doing things also in the sense that I try not to schedule myself to, to, to be doing a lot of a huge amount of on-site stuff at the winter market. Of course, that was out the window when COVID started. It would it, yeah. then it, um, with with the regulations that we had to to do. It was all hands on deck, and I um, I really, you know, I really wore my body out for those two years, as I'm sure a number of you um, did. But um, yeah, my the nice thing now is that I can. And I can work on I can work on long term stuff when I'm there too. Like I can talk to the vendors that we have in common about well, um, you know, what um, would you like to move your space this coming season and long term things like that. So it's not it's not all bad. The uh, the fact that I'm, I have that I have another thing going on at that time. Yeah, I agree with that, Rebecca. Just like. Uh, um... An unexpected, uh, you know, rose or success or whatever of the winter season is it does slow down a little bit during the market that I can actually talk to vendors, which is not always the case if I'm on, you know, on site during the summer season. It's like th there's too much happening that I can't actually like address people. And you can only do so much via like email and, you know, text that it's nice to actually have a, you know, five to 10 minute conversation with vendors. So that's that's nice, too. Yeah, the winter market is definitely the biggest community building. I don't know with customers, but at least with with vendors, like we're all in it together. We're all huddled. We're all a little miserable. And uh, yeah, it's it's kind of it's fun in its own way. Fun. Yeah. 
Um, I want to be sensitive of time. So if there's any maybe like last minute questions, um, if not, uh, maybe you can, we're all on the off Melissa serve. You can, you know, you know where to get your questions answered if you have them. Um, I have but I just want to ask you, if yeah. you can like, just like a quick, like how was, was this helpful or not helpful for you? Um, I'm wondering, like when you're making the decision to do these winter markets, like how much did you look at data and things that you, sales that you collected, how helpful was that for you in making that decision? For us, I don't know that we really like had any data to collect to analyze winter seas. Like there was nothing else operating during the winter that we could be like, try to like compare, you know, we're either only winters, winter market um, in the gorge still. So like for us, we were just like, we pulled customers they were interested and we pulled vendors and they were interested and we had a spot and we had the staff, you know, and like we started small, you know, like I think if you were to start doing a weekly or even twice a month thing, like maybe you'd want to have a little bit more, but because we started once a month, it was just like, let's try, let's try it, you know? Yeah. For, for me, I mean, Amanda, were you there when Montevilla started doing you weren't there when we started the winter stock ups. Yeah, no, they so, already had the winter stock ups, those monthly okay. things going when it was there. Yeah. <laughs> so to decide to go fully around it, it was just, I got, I came into the organization and the board was just saying, like, all the farmers want you to do this. Um, they all want you. And I was like, okay, great. So, no, no analyzing <laughs> data at that time. Cool. Well, thanks everyone for your time and thanks to Afma for hosting this um, and Lisa and Jess for your time as well. Um, I appreciate everyone being here and have a good rest of your day then. Thank Bye. you. Bye.